Okay, in this video, we're going to be looking at organic geochemistry, the fundamentals of a substance known as carogen. Now, it is very interesting to note that carogen is defined as a sedimentary organic matter, basically of sedimentary origin. It is mostly insoluble in water, alkali, non-oxidizing acids, and even organic solvents such as benzene, methanol, toluene, and methylene chloride. Carogen is an inhomogeneous macromolecular aggregate, meaning inhomogeneous meaning it is not having the same chemical composition in all points. Macromolecular means basically it has more than one type of molecule. It makes up about 90% or more of organic matter in sedimentary rocks, and that's a lot of organic matter there. And much of the remainder being dispersed bitumen. You can always check out what bitumen is. The carogen then becomes the far, by far the most abundant form of organic carbon on Earth. It is three orders of magnitude more abundant than coal, petroleum, and gas, and four orders of magnitude more abundant than living biomass. So then carogen becomes a very interesting thing because it is a huge collection of organic material in sedimentary rocks. <clears throat> Essentially, you have two types of carogen. Okay. It's good to know that these two are very important because um, those that are rich in aliphatic compounds, aliphatic here basically refers to light molecular weight compounds, they are usually mobile. Now, these are generally divided or derived, sorry, from aquatic and marine algae. Okay, marine algae and aquatic algae. Therefore, it has a good petroleum potential and it's called sapropylic carogen. So aliphatic basically gives you good petroleum potential. However, those which are derived principally from higher plants, like trees and bushes and whatnot, they are rich in aromatic compounds, and aromatic compounds here basically refers to large molecular substances, they are heavy, not very labile, and these are known as humic carogen and has poor potential, therefore aromatic, basically poor. Now, if you look at the composition of carogen, carbon and hydrogen are usually your main constituents. Okay, Hydrocarbon, when you say hydrocarbon, you need hydrogen and carbon. If you don't have hydrogen and carbon, that ain't no hydrocarbon. The hydrogen, hydrogen concentrations range from about 5 to 18 percent, depending on the type and degree of evolution. On the other hand, oxygen concentrations range from 0.2 to about 3 percent, again, depending on the type and degree of evolution. What is this evolution we're talking about? Well, you'll see that in a short while. Now, besides carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the carogen typically contains, oh, there you go, 1 to 3 percent of nitrogen and 1.25 to 1.5 percent of sulfur. Now, sulfur can be a lot higher in some cases, but we take an average value at this point. You can have a variety of trace metals, notably vanadium and nickel, and these are quite commonly found in carogen as well. All right, what is this carogen classification or evolution that we talked about a bit earlier? You can have three types of classifications, okay, based on the bulk hydrogen to carbon ratio, oxygen to carbon ratio. So this was a plot done by organic chemists a long time ago before it became adapted into the uh, petroleum industry. 
On the y-axis, you have the hydrogen to carbon atomic ratio. On the x-axis, you have the oxygen to carbon atomic ratio. <clears throat> so when you plot the values for many types of carogen, you end up having at least three types. To be honest, four. The fourth one is here, but it's not shown in this diagram. The type one is very high in the hydrogen carbon atomic ratio. Okay? And it's quite low in the oxygen to carbon atomic ratio. Type two is somewhat intermediate in terms of its hydrogen carbon ratio and oxygen carbon ratio, oxygen carbon ratio. Type three, on the other hand, is lower on its uh, hydrogen to carbon ratio, but a lot higher on its oxygen to carbon ratio. <clears throat> so as you move from type one to type three, you have a steady enrichment of oxygen to carbon ratio and steady depletion of hydrogen to carbon ratio. But if you take a sample here, and as it evolves in terms of maturity, it's going to go down this line and come this way. Same for anything else. So in terms of maturity evolution, you actually find the sample moving down this way, which means that you have a steady depletion in hydrogen carbon and oxygen carbon ratio. So type one, carogen, is typified, as I said earlier, by a high hydrogen carbon ratio. Usually a typical value is 1.5, okay? And a low oxygen to carbon ratio, usually less than 0 0.1. <clears throat> These are rich in lipids. Everybody knows what lipids are. Especially long chain aliphatics. Okay, these are good guys, they give you a lot of petroleum and has a high petroleum potential. It is derived primarily from algal and bacterial remains, usually which are deposited in aquatic and estuary environment. <clears throat> Typical examples are your Green River Shale or Western US. Okay? So this is what type one is all about. Now, when we look at type two, okay, that is there, is um, actually the most common type because it has intermediate values for hydrogen carbon ratio and oxygen carbon ratio. Now, interestingly enough, it is uh, derived from planktons, bacterial remains deposited in marine environments, and some remains of high plants from the terrestrial environment. So this guy is actually a mixture. It's got something from the sea and something from the land. Now, because of its marine origin, it is often rich in sulfur. Okay, the lipid content of oil and oil potential are somewhat lower than type 1, of course, understandably. Now, what's the contribution of high plants? Well, let's look at type 3 to understand that. Type 3 carogen has low hydrogen carbon ratios, usually less than 1 and high oxygen carbon ratio is usually about 0.3 or less. You can see the values here. These are rich in aromatic, okay, heavy molecules, and poor in aliphatic structures. If you want to know why there is a difference between aromatic and aliphatic, <clears throat> you can refer to another video on um, organic matter diagenesis. That gives you one possible reason why you have these differences. The other reason why you have a difference in uh, the amount of aromatic versus aliphatic structures is simply because these are formed from vascular plants, trees, branches, leaves, roots. Because of that, the oil potential is poor in type 3. But it's a good source of gas, huh? particularly methane, which is CH4. So you have oil here, and you got gas there, and you have oil and gas somewhere here. Okay. <clears throat> Finally, 
if you look at the hydrocarbon generation very generally as a function of depth and temperature, you will somewhat get this kind of a picture. You can find this in every lecture note worldwide and even in the book by Tissot and Welt in 1984. <clears throat> in the top layers, say up to over one kilometer, you call this thermal evolution as diagenesis. And if you go a bit deeper, say up to about uh, three kilometers or so, you call it catagenesis. Anything deeper than three kilometers, more or less, you call it metagenesis. Now, please, this depth of one, three kilometers and all that depends on your geothermal gradient. Huh? I'm leaving all these complications out simply because this is just a simple introduction. If the geothermal gradient is different, these depths can vary. And these designations will vary accordingly. Okay? Now, in the shallow areas, usually up to about two or three meters from the surface, you tend to have what is known as a biogenic methane. In this case, you've got a truckload of bacteria that actually digest the organic material and give out methane, which is CH4. Later on, the biogenic methane ceases to exist. And you have thermogenic methane. Thermogenic methane. Why? Temperature is increasing and that plays a bigger role than bacteria. So if you have a distribution of, um, let's say, um, hydrocarbon from top to about three meters or three kilometers, okay, then they can be locked up in terms of fossils or plants, it really doesn't matter. Just hydrocarbon locked up this way. If you look at the type of hydrocarbon with depth, of course, the top two, three meters, you have biogenic methane. And as you go deeper, you have thermogenic methane, okay, which is colored in blue here. And after about 150 degrees or so Celsius, you have a amount of huge amount of gas, okay, but these are dry gas. The wet gas is somewhere around here. Okay. Now, before the maximum evolution of gas, the hydrocarbon actually breaks up, crack would be a better term, but breaks up to give you an oil fraction. Okay, and that peaks around 125 degrees or so. Again, that depends on your local geothermal gradient. Now, this oil formation is around here. And when the temperature goes more than that for the peak of oil window, you have basically gas. That's not too difficult to understand. Now, I'd like to bring your attention back to this thing called biogenic methane. It's a pretty confusing term, you know. I know that it evolves from the action of bacteria, but has anybody ever seen this before? Yes, lots of times. In England, in the box, you have um, very supernatural apparitions. It looks like a spirit that is floating over the ground, and that's nothing but your methane, a biogenic methane moving around. In the tropics, if you go to peat areas, and if you were to drill in somewhat compacted peat areas, all of a sudden you will have the release of huge amount of methane gas. And that's just two or three meters in depth. That's about it. Nothing more, nothing less. So you have actual examples of biogenic methane. You can see it around. Okay. So I think you should have understood this whole topic by now. Okay. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed learning something about um, carogen and the distribution of oil and gas with the depth as much as I've enjoyed teaching it to you. Do look out for more videos on organic geochemistry and um, happy learning.